Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our new uh, latest installment of the um, Monash Advanced Microscopy Seminars. I'm Gian, I'm a Senior Microscopist and Image Analyst at Monash Microimaging. I'm coming to you today from the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respect to their elders, past and present. I have the great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Professor Klaus Hahn. Uh, Professor Han was, is uh, studied at the University of Pennsylvania and obtained his PhD in chemistry from the University of Virginia, Virginia. After beginning his independent career at the Scripps Research Institute, he then moved to the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, where his lab is still located. His research focuses on developing tools and methods to visualize and control protein activity in live cells and animals. And then they apply these methods to elucidate the spatial temporal control of signaling, particularly the adhesion of organelles in uh, metastasis and at the interaction between immune cells. And they have obviously been very successful in their endeavor based on the impressive number of publications coming out of the lab with over 110 articles published, many of them in the prestigious two, Nature and Science, but more important than publication, Dr. Han's research has been cited over 20,000 times, which demonstrate how important their research and the tools they developed are to the community. His work is truly inspirational. And if one day you feel a bit down, I recommend you check out their lab website and their cell cinema. You will see some really cool uh, movies, which uh, certainly will reinvigorate your enthusiasm for cell imaging. Today's talk is titled Watching and Controlling Protein Conformation in Life Cells from Single Molecules to Casualty uh, <laughs> Causality Analysis. And uh, thank you, Professor Han. Well, thank you. Uh, your introduction was encouraging and inspiring. In fact, I appreciate it. Because uh, sometimes I wonder if these tools are actually being used and where. And I think my mission is basically to make them easy to use and make them available to people. And um, today I've sort of, I've set up the talk along those lines, um, trying to give an overview of primarily the optogenetics tools that people seem to be using a great deal these days, optogenetics and chemogenetics. And I also wanna let everyone know that we have a center now whose purpose is to help you and anyone who approaches us to not only use, but to build tools for your molecules. And I'd be very happy to discuss your own projects with you and see if we can apply some of these methods we've developed to some new areas of science it would be quite exciting. So as you heard in the kind introduction, we're trying to understand the aspects of signaling and cytoskeletal dynamics that really can be understood completely only by seeing them and studying them within cells. Uh, and I like to use this simple analogy here to, to explain to some extent what I mean. So some folks that have a more sort of reductionist approach to their biology, see the cell is divided into different uh, functional segments. You may have a lot of inputs that the cell is sensing. Then comes the signaling, like a computer that decides what to do, and then speaks to the portions of the cell that actually move and do things. But in reality, I, I think it's much more like a transformer toy, where the same parts that are used for signaling in one case can be rearranged and become a part of mechanical force transduction, or the cytoskeleton, and the cell will completely alter its internal environment and all of its parts, depending on what it needs to do. Obviously, that's a very dynamic process, and it's difficult to understand it by isolating all the parts. So the goal that we have uh, with our tool development and in the lab, let's see if I can do that for you. There you go is to study several systems where that's especially important. And I don't wanna go into that too much today. I thought today would be really tool focused because this is a microscopy session after all. And I'd like to emphasize as many tools as I can for you without just presenting a list. But I did wanna focus in on one particular biology that really applies most of what we develop. We're trying to understand how uh, how metastatic cells leave a tumor and know almost mysteriously exactly where the vasculature is and they go directly to the blood vessels. One of the major hypotheses is that they alter the collagen around the tumor and cause it to become more aligned and make a, essentially railroad tracks that lead from the tumor to the vasculature and then move along the aligned collagen. 
And that has a lot of basis now in observation and even practical application. Pathologists look at the collagen signature around tumors to predict prognosis. So here you see a benign tumor with this sort of random uh, orientation of the collagen. And as the tumor becomes more metastatic, you, you go through a series of tumor-associated collagen signatures or TACs. The worst one is tax 3 where you can see it's quite a line compared to the wild type. So if you look at the cells leaving the tumor, this is a normal, normal cell walking around on the non-aligned collagen random protrusions, all directions. And here's a cell walking on the aligned collagen. It takes a completely different morphology and makes a beeline along the aligned collagen. So what we're trying to do is understand how it knows where the aligned collagen is. And there's a lot on this slide. Basically, there's a circuit involved that, that is used to both test the forces the cell experience and thereby understand how the collagen is aligned and then to communicate outwards to the motility machinery and become part of the motility machinery and cause the cell to move along the fibers. So today you'll hear a lot about these GTPases, the row family GTPases, which are key signaling molecules in the whole circuit. And they take, they take two forms. They're active when they have GTP on them, guanosine triphosphate, and their enzymes, they hydrolyze it down to GDP, turn themselves off. And this whole catalytic cycle here is controlled by a series of other proteins that are precisely placed and decide when and where the various GTPases are turned on. So the GEFs, guanine exchange factors, are very important. They catalyze the removal of GDP and reassociation with GTP. And these other ones, we won't go into too much uh, today. They anchor the protein in various places or inactivate it. So if you look at this diagram here of the circuit that we're studying, uh, here are the GTPases. And there are far fewer of those than there are of these upstream regulators, the GEFs and GAPs. And the GEFs and GAPs are also placing the proteins in various spots. Importantly, as a signal moves from an initially sensing the environment through the GEFs and GAPs into the GTPases and then to the effectors, which the GTPases control to actually make the cell do things, there are feedback loops at every level. So it's quite complex temporally and spatially. The particular input that we're looking at, I think is really fascinating. It's an example of what you might call a dynamic organelle. So there's a lot of these in the cell, podosomes and beta podia, focal adhesions, and they're quite complicated structures with sometimes hundreds of proteins in them, well-organized, yet they're constantly changing their components, their composition, depending on what they have to do. And this particular dynamic organelle, the focal adhesion, is what these cells are using to, to uh, sense their mechanics of their environment. So our hypothesis that we're pursuing is that the cell is pulling all along its edges and if you imagine a rope attached to a wall and you're trying to pull it off the wall, it's pretty hard to do. But if somebody comes from the side and sort of twangs the rope, that's not so tough. So the cell will be moving in the direction of most resistance. So it has to feel the force. And today um, we'll focus on two proteins, the yellow talon and the green vinculin. And the, these are especially interesting because they're the the connection between force and all the other signaling, at least one of the major connections. And the way that happens is that as the tailin is pulled upon, it becomes longer and longer and exposes different binding sites along its length. Each one then binds a different molecule and initiates a signaling cascade. So here's a really great movie, I think, from Barnett and Gould, who have put a lot of these movies on YouTube. And it shows the stretching of tail. And one end is attached to the integrins, the other two actin. And as the force is felt and the actin contracts and stretches the tail in, you'll see here this REM, which binds to the unstretched form, fall off. And then the two vinculins come in and themselves attach to tailin, which is just one example of the many kinds of interactions that occur along here as this thing is stretched. So what do we want to do in our research and what are these tools for? The plan we have, what we're trying to accomplish is to control protein behavior with the same spatial and temporal resolution that is used to manipulate the signaling and the polarized motility. So we wanna use optogenetics and chemogenetics to turn on specific proteins with seconds 
and submicron resolution, and then watch downstream events, watch the activation or conformational changes, phosphorylation of molecules that are triggered to change their conformation because of this activation. So the challenge here is to be able to do multiplexed imaging where we control one molecule. Here we're turning on RAC1 here, one of the GTPases, and visualize the activation, for example, of PAC1. And um, what I want to do in today's talk is tell you how we've approached this challenge and sort of organize it around tools that you hopefully will find useful. And the talk will have two parts. First, in yellow here, I'm going to talk about the major types of control tools that we've developed that seem to have gotten a lot of use, which I therefore you know, believe are robust and uh, have a lot of experience with, so I could help you with them. And then in the second half, I'll talk about the biosensors, the sensing. And in this, I'm going to include some new stuff that we've done more recently, along with a quick summary of the kinds of technologies we have available. So let's jump into the control of proteins with light or small molecules. I'm sure you're aware this is a burgeoning field. It's really interesting engineering how people have taken all these and other proteins that nature has created to respond to light and have attached them and built them into other proteins that normally have no light response so that we can control the conformation of the, of the targeted protein. And I don't have time to really go through this, but I want to show some contrast. So some of these are big, some of them are little, some of them require the addition of a cofactor. Others uh, need simply a very abundant cofactor that's present in almost all life, like uh, the, um, the flavin in the love domain. And they work through different mechanisms, either association, disassociation, or in the case we're going to focus on, they actually change conformation. They have these cofactors because these are the light absorbing units. So all of the work I'm going to show you today is based on the love domain. And you might call it love Lego because we became really fascinated with this. As more and more other domains were discovered, we realized they were different Lego pieces and are starting to play with them. But what I can mainly offer today is the per various permutations on using this one photoresponsive domain to make your proteins do a variety of things. And I'm going to try to quickly go through, maybe flavored with an example or two, this thing we call photoactable GTP aces, the first thing we did, so it has a rather plain name. And then um, Love Trap, uh, Z Lock, two things both based on this uh, unique AFA body we found that binds to the dark state of love. And finally, I want to emphasize this because I think it's the most versatile and, and perhaps the most interesting mechanistically, which is loopology. So let's see here. All right, so if we begin with the photoactivatable rack, let me introduce you to the love domain first. And I'm going to get my timer out here. Okay, so um, the love domain has a globular portion in green here. Embedded in it is this flavin, which is the light absorbing cofactor. On the very terminus is an alpha helix, the J alpha helix. It's held in place by hydrogen bonds between the two basic regions. Uh, when the flavin gets excited through absorption of a photon, that enables a nearby cysteine to make a covalent bond with the flavin and through a relay action that basically knocks out some of the hydrogen bonds that are essential and this terminus unwinds. So what you have is a Lego building block that's a round ball, kind of like a yo-yo. You shine light on it and the string comes out or it contracts back in again. And the way we use this at first, our first photoactivatable analog is we took rack which is a good one to try because it controls cell movement so you can see what you've done. And we attach this love domain such that it covers the active site of RAC. We knocked out the upstream regulatory sites with point mutations so that all the RAC activity was under our control. And the idea was that you would have a, an inert RAC, you shine light and this short string becomes long, freeing the active site you know, from the steric block of the love. We were very excited when one of the first movies we saw was this here. Um, this is a laser beam shining on the cell expressing the photoactivatable rack. And you see wherever the light is shining that you generate a protrusion, which was good evidence that this worked. And we did things like anchor at the membrane to reduce diffusion and narrow down the area that was activated to improve spatial resolution all these published things i don't want to go into it in much detail but i will mention that if you get into doing this for real 
you know, give me a call or an email. So we use this to study cell polarity, where we show that if you activate on one side of a cell, you have protrusion and on the other retraction. And we wanted to know if this was just a mechanical pulling or if there was actually, as was hypothesized, then a gradient of various activities that was triggered by RAC acti activation here. And sure enough, if we use the dominant negative and activated it, we got a retraction nearby and a protrusion on the other side. And perhaps the most exciting applications involve movement of individual cells. So if you take this, I believe it's a HeLa cell, and you put a laser beam near it, it sort of follows the laser beam like a cat would. And that became very exciting to people that approached us. We, we got into areas of science we never realized would be valuable because we're cell biologists. And some examples here, Denise Montel was able to move cells around in the Drosophila ovary and look at effects on development. And um, Anna Hootenlocher uh, at Wisconsin looked at the movement of neutrophils in and out of tumors. Here's a neutrophil spelling the word rack, which I have to show in every seminar. Um, so uh, I, I won't dwell on this, but, but there are a lot of really interesting applications. For example, if you allow the brain to form memories, as in a mouse going through a maze, using rack that's only functional when it's irradiated through a cannula into the brain, you can turn the memories on and off. You can make the mouse forget the maze or bring it back by turning the light on. In practical terms, you'll find that if you're working in mice, it's not very practical to have to shine light continuously, or if you're working in embryos or other systems, the, the love domain turns on very rapidly, uh, milliseconds at the very, is even slow. I don't remember the exact time, <clears throat> but by placing mutations around the flavin, you can control the off rate, how long it stays excited. So if you use a mutation, uh, mutation that uh, keeps it excited for 600 seconds or 10 minutes, <clears throat> it's best for an animal experiment. You know, you can only pulse, you only have to pulse with light every 10 minutes. But if you're trying to do precise kinetics within single cells, the, you can get a time resolution of about 2.4 seconds. So we then moved on to use this interesting Lego block in a number of ways, each with different practical applications. And I wanna show you them and one or two examples really quickly. So the first one of those is the love trap. And the idea here is that we took an aphibody, which is a, a small screenable scaffold derived from protein kinase A, and we did screening with Rehalu to find a version of it bearing these residues that binds only to the dark state, not the lit state of love. And here you see the crystal structure from Ilma Schlichting. This is our Z dark one. And it, 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 it grabs the end of the helix and a little portion of the globular domain. So the basic concept is that you anchor love at the mitochondrion, then you put this Z dark on either terminus of your protein of interest. And when you irradiate, it falls off. So in the dark, it's sequestered on the mitochondria. I'll run this movie in the upper right, if I can. Let's see. There you go. So it's now on the mitochondria. Whenever the blue dot shows up, the light is going on. And you see it just moves back and forth from the mitochondria to distribute everywhere. And the GTPases are active only at the plasma membrane. So it's a great way to control them. And I wanted to show you how valuable this is. This is where you have precise kinetic control. We were studying the role of oscillation. So certain signaling circuits in real cells uh, are regulated by the frequency of oscillations of the, of the signal. And that's pretty difficult to get at without being able to change frequencies within cells. We discovered that when we activated BAV2, which you see down on the bottom here, it's one of the GEFs. Come on now. It did something very surprising. We thought it would just produce a protrusion, but instead it violently oscillated. And uh, in the magnitude of the oscillations, their, um, the extent of the protrusion was dependent on the intensity of the light. But something else was dependent on the intensity of the light too, and that was the frequency, which led to a really interesting uh, series of observations and studies. And a lot of the work that we've done we do in partnership with Gaudens Danuser at UTSW, who develops really amazing analytical techniques. And I have to say the biosensors, the 
um, optogenetics, they can only go so far in terms of if you use only qualitative observations. I think their real strength is that they can be quantitative. They're dose dependent. You can precisely control the frequency. So working with very quantitative analysis and modeling has been able to uh, teach us much more about the cell. So long story short, Gaudens and Marco Valella in his lab uh, use the Hilbert Wong transform. You can think of it sort of like a Fourier transform, but it gives you instantaneous velocity. You don't need to look at the frequencies over a range of times. So we have here a, a series of boxes at the edges of a cell. And the boxes will, and in every box, we measured protrusion and retraction rate. And at the same time, we measured um, various properties within the box, like a biosensor. And like I said, I shouldn't go into much detail or we'll run out of time. But basically all these edge segments are shown here. And then this is the velocity of the edge over time. So you see some regions that were rapidly protruding, others that were retracting, some that were going through oscillations through here. And if you do the, the, the Hilbert spectrum, you get the frequency distribution. So right here is where the light was turned on. And you see that only then do we generate these higher, these, uh, higher frequencies. But when we looked at that more closely, we discovered something surprising. If you do continuous irradiation, as you have right here, you see a really a predominant frequency. So this is the frequency distribution, frequency amplitude. And you see this predominant peak at about three millihertz, which is relatively slow. This all sort of going like this. And then we decided to see if there was something special about that. And we found that when we drove the cell at 3.3 millihertz, you see here we're pulsing the light for 3.3 millihertz frequencies. We saw that the cell would follow our lead and we could nicely generate a frequency of oscillation of 3.3 and interestingly also multiples of that. So then we tried to drive it at different frequencies and we found that if we drove at a multiple of 3.3 or close to it, we would, we would be able to see this predominant frequency of 3.3 and its multiples. But if we drove at something that was not a multiple of three, we just got this random distribution of cell frequencies at the edge. And basically what we found is that this signaling circuit has is a resonator. It has a resonant frequency because of the rates between each step in the signaling path. You know, there'll be some rate limiting steps. It can only travel, the information can only travel at certain rates. And we did knockdown studies and inhibitors and other things to prove that this oscillating circuit, which had been hypothesized in the literature, was in fact what we were seeing. So that is an example of how very precise frequency control coupled with analysis can open the door, open a window to new kinds of biology. And I just have one slide of this. So this has been handy too. Let's say you want to, you have an enzyme that has an activity that you'd like to control, like cutting actin, like cleaving it like a pair of scissors in an exact place. What you can do is pair your enzyme down so you only have the active site and we control it by putting love on one terminus and Z-dark on the other. And sometimes we use circular permutation to move the termini around. And in the dark, these bind to each other and you have to place them over the active site. And we have some papers with computational tools that show you how to build these linkers to, to have the thing sit where you want it. And when you shine light on it, the Z-dark can no longer bind the love. You remember I said the Z-dark binds only to the dark state and you expose the active site. So it's a very nice way to cage enzymes. One thing we discovered is that the same Z-dark love that worked well in the other analogs would never open here. And that's because this is an intramolecular interaction. So we had to make mutations in the Z-dark to produce different affinities of the Z-dark for the love. And there's now a tool chest available you, for you to engineer things yourself. I want to go, I want to make sure I don't run out of time here. Okay, so, because uh, I want to show you some of the new work too. This I think is perhaps the most versatile and mechanistically interesting of the love-based techniques. And it's not really a love-based technique. This was generalized out well beyond just using love. And let me sort of summarize here. What we've shown is that um, this is well understood is that there are these things called tight loops on the surfaces of proteins. You know, the one globular domain that you might examine or a tightly folded domain consists of some rather well-known secondary structure motifs like alpha helis, beta pleated sheet, and the, the boring part 
is this little loop that holds them all together. And surprisingly, the length of these loops are very conserved. If you look at this loop length across the whole PDB, it's a pretty narrow distribution. So we just saw that that loop length matched the difference, the distance between in the N and the C terminus of love. And we tried something that worked. We took these N and C termini and we clipped them into one of these loops. So you would have a love domain hanging here instead of a loop. When the love is in the dark, it's pretty rigid. It mimics the loop rather well. But when you shine light, you suddenly put a big loose thing across there where there was once a loop. The entropy is communicated into the protein and you turn it off. So you inhibit the protein with light. But the most important thing and the most valuable thing is that you can use loops that are very far from any binding site on the protein. So GTPases, for example, the active site is here. And if you mess up this loop, you communicate the change in structure through this beta pleated sheet and disturb the active site. And we've been able to do this now for kinases, GEFs, GAPs, a number of different proteins. And I'll show you briefly how. We also wanted to use um, chemogenetics. If you're doing studies in animals, you don't wanna have to shine light inside necessarily. So we took analogs of rapamycin that do not impact the mTOR pathway. And we combined um, portions of FKBP and uh, FRB, which are two proteins that are brought together when they're exposed to rapamycin. And we turned them into one domain, again, with an N and C terminus that was 10 angstroms apart. So you could clip this thing into a loop. This sort of worked in the opposite way of love. When there was no rapamycin around, this was very loose. And you would take for kinase, for example, and make it inert. So you could express this thing in cells. It would have minimal activity and you add your membrane permeable rapamycin and you turn your kinase on. And in the interest of time, I'll briefly go through how this whole thing is built. Um, here's the FRB and the FKBP with the rapamycin inside it. And we began, and this is useful in some cases, to leave them separate. So you only put this in your target protein and you cut the terminus back bringing the, the two termini close together to match the loop distance. And this alone is sufficient to knock out the kinase. When you then add rapamycin, it brings in co-expressed FRB and you restore activity. This is useful in things like split proteins where you can have no residual activity until the two are brought together because this thing will attach the one half of the split protein will really degrade activity until you reconstitute. Um, Molecular modeling shows how it works. And I bring this up only because it makes it particularly easy to use. This is conserved across serine, threonine kinases, tyrosine kinases. So there's the ATP binding loop here, the G loop, which is part of the active site. On the back side of the protein, where most proteins have no ligand binding, we insert this IFKBP right here. And you can see that in the absence of rapamycin, there's a lot of molecular mobility. And then when we add the rapamycin, this cools down, effectively reducing the vibration of this G-loop and making it capable of uh, kinase activity. You can find that loop very easily. If you look for these features within the kinases, there's certain sets of beta pleated sheets and there's a methods article, so I won't go into it. The example I wanted to show you today involves the Sark family kinases. Uh, they're very similar. They're greater, I believe, than 80% homologous. And it's difficult to understand their individual functions because they often act in concert. You can't really knock one out and see what happens because the other ones compensate. Um, and there's, it's pretty difficult to make a drug that is specific for one of these isoforms. But with this wrapper or rapamycin regulated kinase, you can turn on each of the individual isoforms and the cell will never know what hit it. No time for compensation. And I just want to show you how different they are um, because this was not visible before. So you add rapamycin to fin and you see it induces spreading. If you add it to SARC, it initially spreads and then it polarizes and moves. And then some of the kinases do unnatural things. So the Lin here, uh, it produces kinked phyllopodia. Look down here, it makes a phyllopodium with a 90 degree bend in it. So it must be working together with the other ones because this doesn't happen normally to these cells. 
I just wanted to illustrate quickly that it works for love as well. Rack was particularly challenging. Almost all of the surface of rack is covered either with effector binding sites or these regulatory binding sites, but we were lucky there was a single loop sticking out that we could use. And other people have applied this now, and rather than try to identify loops, they do high throughput techniques where they just stick the domain in everything. And you can do that, but most cells don't have too many loops. And an easy way to do this is just to try them all and then optimize the linkers a little bit. If you want to automate it, we have an article out, a methods article, uh, to automate finding the exposed loops first, asking which of them are highly conserved and not using the conserved ones. And then that already narrows things down a lot. You can also do molecular dynamics si simulations and ask which loops have movement that's correlated with vibrations within the active site. And what I wanted to show you here, I, I told you about feedback loops. Um, when we inhibit RAC1, you would imagine that the ruffling or constitutive movement of a cell would die down. But what you see instead is that upon initial inhibition, you exaggerate the movements and then it fades down. And that has to do with the feedback mechanisms involved, which we're trying to understand. So, uh-oh. Looks like the movie is hanging. I'll try one more time. Well, that's unfortunate, but what happens is this thing suddenly goes crazy and then it dies down and in a rather dramatic way. So it's good for to show in a talk. All right, so let me now move into the, the latter half and show you some of the new work we've been doing that I think will solve problems with some the biosensors, especially in multiplexing. What we found, um, okay, so let me go into this in a little detail. The biosensors that we work on, you know, there are these different designs. A lot of very useful ones are based on protein substrates that change color, say when a kinase comes in and phosphorylates them. And, you know, that would be useful in certain cases. Um, the advantage of this technique is that you're actually looking at the protein, not at a substrate that can diffuse away or be subject to, say, kinases and phosphatases but it has its own problems. So these ones that we focus on are based on affinity reagent. What's an affinity reagent? Imagine this is a GTPA. So here's the inactive and the active conformation. You have to find something that binds only to the active conformation. That can be a domain of a downstream effector. You know, the active protein, active GTPAs will interact with an effector only when it's active. So you can cut a fragment out of the effector, use it as an affinity reagent. We've used antibody fragments. We and others have used engineered scaffolds, even small molecules. And then you can have a variety of readouts. In this case, it's FRET. So whenever this rack becomes active, this domain binds to it and brings the fluorophores close enough for FRET. Another thing that we've been doing, well, let me put it this way. When we get into the multiplexing, it's turned out that the major obstacle is cell toxicity. You know, we have to titrate the amount of biosensor we can use and find cutoffs for average brightness. We don't go above those because we begin to see toxicity. Uh, but when we put two sensors in there or even more, that problem becomes really bad. And we have to work at very low levels where the signal is really noisy. For low abundance proteins, we can't do it at all. So we really had to focus on the toxicity issue. And one thing we've done is develop these environment sensing dyes that go into the cell through the membrane. And we've labeled SNAP and HALO tags. We've you've done some work with unnatural amino acids. In the early days, we would just isolate proteins, label them and inject them or electroporate them in. But the point is that with this dye on the affinity reagent, you don't need to put anything on your target protein. The dye changes color when it binds to the protein target. So you can look at endogenous target. Even with that though, we had, we had issues primarily with the dyes going to the proper place inside the cell. So I wanted to show you something new and I'm going to skip um, some of this so that I have enough time to talk to you. So Dan Marston in the lab, he worked with Brian Kuhlman, who uses Rosetta to look at protein interfaces and look carefully at the reason that these things were toxic. So, you know, the endogenous proteins, I'm sorry, I have a Zoom thing on my slide. Okay, so, you know, I've told you how the GTPase is bind effectors uh, when the GTPase has GTP on it. Look at the biosensors. So what the ideal biosensor does, it has this affinity reagent, 
and the affinity reagent binds, but all of them to date have been derived, at least the vast majority, have been derived from endogenous, from effector molecules, not endogenous, but from effector proteins. So they bind to the very site that's supposed to be triggered when the GTPase is activated. So you can imagine that these biosensors produce dominant negative effects. The other thing they do is they have overexpression artifacts because you have to add fluorescently labeled GTPase over and above the endogenous. So what Dan did with Brian is altered the interfaces between the affinity reagent and the GTPase. Look at the wild type biosensor here. What are some of the bad interactions? Here's the GTPase that's fluorescent interacting with an endogenous effector. So you use up some of your fluorescent GTPase and you don't generate any signal in FRET. Here you have um, the affinity reagent binding to endogenous GTPase. So it's tying up the GTPase, creating dominant negative effects. Again, no FRET. This is what you want to see. And the more of this that goes on, the more of your perturbing biosensor components you have to add. So what we tried to do was alter the interface between the affinity reagent and the GTPase so that they could only bind to one another and not to any of the endogenous components. So you can imagine this is then an altered interface. So now this thing will no longer bind to endogenous. The fluorescent GTPase won't bind to effector, but they do bind to each other. And we did that with a number of different uh, methods. One was a knob and hole where we put a big residue in the interface and then made an opening for it. The one that worked best is if we simply did a charge swap. So here you have a, an aspartic acid and a lysine. Uh, this is, I believe, the RAL biosensor. And if you just switch them over, they still bind nicely, but they can no longer interact with the endogenous components. And you see some examples here. This is one of the best ones. The black is the binding curve for um, activation. We have activation by a GEF, and you see enhanced amounts of FRET reaching a plateau. The red is the orthogonal interface, and the blue and green are off-target interactions. And we don't always have a perfect situation. This is RAC and this is RAP, uh, but it certainly matters. So here you see the speed of protrusions and retractions, and in green is the dose-dependent perturbation by the wild type biosensor. You see the speed going down for both CDC42 and RAC. And then here's the orthogonal one. So at similar concentrations, no effect or greatly reduced perturbation. And that's now made it possible for us to do very interesting types of analysis with gout ends. And that's the causality I want to talk to you about, but I'm not going to get into that today because of time. But if you look at um, this new website from the center I mentioned, all of that's available to you. It's on GitHub and can be done. And the, the basic idea is that uh, the Nobel Prize for Economics was won by somebody who showed correlations between stocks. And he asked if the behavior of one stock can predict the behavior of another, this is very simplified, uh, then they're correlated, but they're not only correlated, there's causality involved because it has directionality. It only goes in one direction. So Gaudens is applying that now to map out the signaling pathways. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to go backwards and generate diagrams at the edge of a cell where he shows which GEFs are responsible for cell edge movement, what percentage of that signal is coming from which GEFs uh, when they're working through another protein. So just really mapping the signaling pathways using this kind of correlation and causality analysis that requires multiplexing, which has been made much more easy and which we're now able to use through these orthogonal things. The last thing I want to talk to you about with the remaining time, it's something that I'm really excited about, excited about and has yielded some really interesting new directions for us. So we wanted to see single molecule conformational changes in live cells. We're looking at little things, potosomes, structures within adhesions. And um, basically you have to understand the structures involved, the distribution of molecules on a, at least a near single molecule level, if not single molecule. So the problem with doing FRET, for example, at the single molecule level is the signal is just too weak. You, for, for many cases, you have indirect excitation of the acceptor fluorophore. So it's not the same as shining your exciting light right on that fluorophore. Um, and it's not always very efficient. It depends on distance. So we reasoned that we could do something kind of almost idiotically simple. And I wish sometimes that I had picked not an idiotically simple name, 
but we call it binder tag or BT proteins because we have a series of little tags and something that binds to them very tightly. And this is how when we use it for the single molecule conformational analysis. So here I'm gonna show you the example of SARC kinase. And in this case, we're taking advantage of the auto inhibitory domain that opens up when SARC is activated. Uh, the basic idea is you take this little seven amino acid peptide and you hide it in your protein where it's not exposed in one conformation and is exposed in another. And the binder, which binds tightly to it, will only come and co-localize with your target protein in this conformation. So you can directly excite your dyes. They don't have to have overlap like FRET. You can use the brightest dyes you can, you know, whatever you want. They don't, uh, and you can simply ask at the single particle level, I see a particle in one color, is it associated with a second color? And the ones that are associated are the active molecules. And I just have summarized the engineering in one slide. So this is the open and the closed form of SARC. And we stuck the little seven or tag here on the tail, which folds inward when the thing is closed. And it did work. One thing worth mentioning is that even if you don't care about single molecules, it makes it much easier to engineer FRET biosensors. Instead of having to find an affinity reagent that works or use other methods, you stick this 7 mer in your protein. And it's usually pretty easy to find a place to put something that short without perturbing activity, relatively easy. So here's just a FRET um, biosensor for SART. Uh, where we put on the binder, which is the, uh, this comes from bacteria, SSPB binds to the small seven or SSRA. Because it's from E. coli, we have shown that there's no appreciable binding to the mammalian cell components. So we just took the SSPB, we put one of the floors on here and the other one on the SARC, and we have a nice FRET biosensor. But the purpose that we started with was single molecule analysis. So let me show you that. Here's a control where we just put the binder in the cell and it's not going anywhere. So if you do turf and look at single molecules on the bottom, you don't see much. If you now put the CAX tag to membrane localize your the SSRA, the tag that the binder binds to, you see these events where the binder comes to the membrane and leaves. So the basic idea here is we know that SARC is in the membrane. So we, we express a lot of the binder we don't even have to tag the SARC with a fluorophore. Basically, if any binder comes down and sits on the membrane, we know it's binding to an active SARC. But here's an example where we have in green, a bunch of SARC individual molecules, and you'll see the red binders flitting by until they land. And one of them is yellow for a while, so you know it's active. And um, so that's the basic concept. Quick example of how we used it, we're studying adhesions. So we used an adhesion marker, FAC in this case, and once a minute, we use that marker to segment out and see where the adhesions are. But meanwhile, between those visualizations, we streamed at 50 Hertz to see the molecules, the events of the binder coming to the membrane. It's a shame there's a lot of sluggishness here, but um, you see that you can't tell where adhesions are just from these transient binding events. But if you integrate them over time, you can tell. So here's this box blown up and the black marks show where our fact segmentation showed us adhesions. And if you look at the SARC uh, distribution, uh, quite interestingly, it's not distributed over the whole adhesion. It shows up in these little domains, these clusters of SARC. And that was visible using traditional single molecule imaging approaches. But with binder tag, we can now ask which of those things in the cluster was active. And we found these little islands of activity within the cluster, activation organelles, we're calling them. And we're able to say a lot about their properties, their size, the rates of movement in and out. And we were able to model um, how these particular locations controlled SARC activity in different regions of the cell. And with the time I have left, I wanna show you how we're now extending that to understand what I initially told you about. Unfortunately, we're, I'm really having a lot of trouble with the computer. Uh, let's see. Okay. Okay, so here's tailin, which I showed you in the beginning. Now, if you remember, it's that molecule that gets stretched. And you can see all these different proteins that bind to different sites on it, depending on how stretched it is. Some of these will open first, some of them later. This tailin is so long that if you look at a neuronal spine, for example, when it's closed, it'll be at the tip of the spine. And this is all the work of Ben Gold um, and his coworkers. 
But when it gets fully stretched, it moves through various signaling domains such that you can spatially determine or um, designate which signaling domain within the spine will be affected by the activation event on the tail end. That's how big, how big the thing is. And here's a movie from Golt that shows the folded and unfolded tail end. Okay. Well, what you would see, this little fella is folded. This thing, you could just walk along it for miles and miles, it appears. This is very, very long. Uh, it's a shame that that isn't working, but you get the idea, I guess. Okay. Oh, here we go. No, maybe not. All right. So what are we doing with binder tag? Ben, uh, Gabe, Kyder Letterman in my lab, he started looking at different combinations of peptides and proteins that he could use uh, as tags and binders. And I told you about the 7 mer SSRA with the SSPV protein. We also found another one that works well, which is a Franken body uh, developed by Zhao et al. And it's a combination of two antibody fragments that binds to this small peptide. So what um, Gabe was able to do was put different tags in different places, these different domains of tailin, which are opened at different times during stretching. So we have the R3 domain, the R11 domain. We did some experiments with R8. They each have different biological of functions. And depending on where in the cell it is, we've discovered they open at different times as you have stretching. As a control, we also put a tag here in the linker between the head and tail domains, which is supposed to be always open. I just wanted to show you a few results from that. So um, this is tailin itself. You just stain tailin. The binder one, shown in blue, is always going for a tag that's in the R3 domain, which is thought to be open essentially all the time. And sure enough, if you look at the tail end and where binder one is going, it looks like they're just sitting in the same places. R8, here's the linker, which is supposed to be always open, now using this different tag and binder, and it also nicely parallels the, the tail end position. If we now go though to these, put the tag in these domains that are supposed to require force to open, we begin to see interesting events. Like here, only some, this region does not show co-localization while this region does. And here we have a greatly reduced co-localization at all. One of the most exciting things is when we can see substructure within the adhesions. So this is tailin um, with R11, and you see the linker just shows the adhesion, just like tailin. But the R11 is activated in specific spots within the adhesion. We've done a similar work with vinculin, which is another protein that's stretched. And we can really map here. Again, this is a movie and it's a shame. You see the changing position of the hot spots of, of opening of specific binding sites. And I told you about the um, hypothesis we had. So I won't, let me turn those all off. That the cell was activating vinculin primarily where it's trying to pull along the rope instead of at the sides. So this blue is a collagen fiber that we've laid down on glass. And here in green is a cell moving along. And if the movie were working, you would see that this lights up, that the tailings along the edge are much less active than the one right at the tip. So I think that's probably enough, especially given that the movies are all doing crazy things. Um, and if you have questions or you find this useful, you know, certainly let me know. I'm here to help. Uh, okay. I tried to thank the people during the talk. So I guess we're okay. And here's a brief summary of the various techniques that I showed you. Maybe the most important thing that I can say in summary is that we're now constructing a website that has all the useful information for you. It's just beginning, but it's the Center for Signal Analysis website. Uh, all of the constructs that I discussed and others are available on AdGene, which is a nonprofit that distributes uh, constructs. And we have our own webpage that we're all also working on at hanlab.com. So I apologize for the movies, but I, I hope I was able to get the point across. And thank you very much for the chance to show you this. I hope it's useful to you. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. That was outstanding. So many beautiful movies. And um, I guess you mentioned at one point um, multiplexing. How many of those um, 
does biosensors can you multiplex in one cell? You know, in terms of the wavelengths, um, we have done three and in a crude way four, but that was biologically not useful because of the toxicity issue. So yeah. right now we're sticking to two. We can do a lot with two with the correlation. And as we start trying these methods to reduce toxicity, I'm hoping we can do more. Um, that's the that's the main issue. And we're trying to work with GEFs, which are very low abundance. And um, the I had another question um, regarding, because most of the work that you were showing was in cell. And how able are you to translate that into, so you show some images in um, Drosophila embryo, but translating that into more relevantly uh, relevant biological settings like, you know, full embryos or mammals? Well, there has been work in, uh, people have used the photoactivatable rack in mice for a variety of experiments. I described the one where they controlled memory and there's another one mm -hmm. where rack role in cocaine addiction has been elucidated. And we're now working uh, with a person, Scott Soderling at Duke, who's trying to take all the kinases and combine them with um, Alice Ting's technique where she biotinylates proteins within synapses in live mice. And he's trying to manipulate kinase activity while watching effects on specific protein interactions within the synapses. So we're just getting into that, but uh, we're hopeful. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, yeah. Do Does anyone have a question? Please raise your hand or pop your question in the chat. I don't have any questions. So I might just go on with another of my questions. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> That's my privilege. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm also, as I mentioned, the image analyst at MMI. So I'm quite curious on the softwares that you use. Do you have some home developed softwares or do you use more standards software to analyze all your images? I wish we had another hour because I just mentioned that aside that how important that is. Uh, and we've interacted with a number of different different people who've developed a, different types of software. It's all available and you know I could tell you about it, but basically the stuff that Gaudens is doing has to do with this windowing approach and doing causality analysis and trying to understand, he does it in three dimensions now as well. Then we have um, a lot of work with Tim Elston where they do um, modeling. So standard differential equation modeling, but with a space and time component. And we work on these things like potosomes, which are um, very small organelles. Mm. The macrophages recognize their targets and put potosomes on them. And so we micro pattern fake targets. And then the potosomes make exact circles or squares. And if you trigger something on one side, you can watch the communication between them. So that's a really great thing to model, you know, for differential equation modeling. You can get rates, distances, all that sort of stuff. And then the last fellow that we've done, we've done a work with a bunch of people, but the other fellow that we've done a lot with is Dennis Tsigankov. And he has models where he treats the whole cell as a continuum. That's how he models cell motility instead of looking at individual molecules in space. Mm. But what he's done that I think is really beautiful is very accurate automated modeling of large amounts of cells and their morphological changes and correlating that with biosensor distribution and behavior. Um, so without, I don't know what else to tell you in like 30 seconds, but- That's fascinating. Are, That's so exciting. Um, I think there is a question um, from Laura, uh, with the binder tag, does it unbind after some times or does it bind once and then stays? If the latter does, that mean it keeps the protein in its uh, detecting, act it is detecting active? That's a really good question and has been a challenge that we've had to overcome in interesting ways. So there's a thing out there called spy catcher which uh, does something similar and it's irreversible and that has its own uses. But the point of our thing is that it's reversible. So as the molecules do different things within the cells, you can follow. And if you use uh, the native interaction between the SSRI and the SSPB, for example, one tag binder pair, it will shift the equilibrium to the open form. It doesn't stay on there permanently, but it has a noticeable effect. So we built it tool chest of different affinities by putting mutations in. 
And what's interesting is SARC is very sensitive to this. And I think it's because the site breathes. So it's exposed even when the SARC is supposed to be closed and then it gets trapped by the binder. But other things like the Pax de Talon, for example, or the Vinculin, they're like rocks. Like the thing just binds when it's open and not when it's closed. And so I think it depends on the equilibrium between the open and closed forms and precisely where the thing is placed. And I had a lot of slides talking about the nitty gritty details of how you do this. And I realized people would just start falling asleep, especially if I tried to do that for every one of the techniques. But, but that's the key. It, it comes down to testing it and varying the affinity. And we have a range of peptides you can use. Thank you. So uh, another question from Paul, um, really great talk, given a lot of imaging technique, could you please suggest an effective way to image multicellular large construct out of a 3D printing process? Wow, <laughs> that's an interesting problem. I think if you wanna use biosensors, um, that'll depend a lot on what you want to do. Like a lot of the problems that you encounter with biosensors occur because you're trying to see subcellular distributions. If you want to ask for each cell in your multicellular system, what's happening within it, in a way it's easier because you can use the excess of certain components of the biosensor, um, et cetera, et cetera. But I'd have to understand what specifically you want to find out in there. I like the binder tag because it's bright. So if FRED is a problem, you might be able to do that. But I'll have to admit that the binder tag has issues. And what it basically is, is that you, um, you're you using co-localization. So imagine trying to see uh, co-localization in large fields, like you would if you were using a FRED biosensor and without using turf. It actually is not very easy. And so what we're doing now is we're building a binder that changes color when it binds. So you can use it sort of like you would analyze a fret field. Another thing we're doing is trying to raise the number of particles, the single particles, so they're so high that you can no longer follow the tracks, but you can still tell that there are tracks, right? And so you just integrate the total number of binders present, the total number of tracks, and you get an overall activation for one region. And that allows you to work well below the concentrations you need with a fret biosensor but you get faster imaging because you don't have to accumulate a whole bunch of tracks. Mm -hmm. So um, the question of working in a 3D system depends to some extent on what you're trying to find out. So I guess that's for Paul to, uh, <laughs> to answer. Right. <laughs> well, I can't can't general point. Yeah. Mm. Um, I think that's it. If anyone has another question. Um, if not, please uh, join me virtually to um, to thank our wonderful speaker for today. Thank you so much, Klaus. Um, that was such a great talk and uh, lots to think about now when we plan some uh, experiments. I appreciate it. I hope you have a great day and I will dream of this shortly. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye.